ISFSI happy hour, and it's the first one of July, so July 1st. It's good to see everyone, and uh, looks like we have a great presentation today from uh, Rachel from uh, Innerschutz and also uh, Commissioner Thiel from Philadelphia Fire and others as we participate today. And as always, the ISFSI uh, happy hour is, is uh, derived from our inability to meet each other in person and build relationships uh, which we traditionally would have done during IFI, well, during uh, FDIC and other events this year. And uh, pretty neat, we have Dr. Michael Reich on also, which is where Innerschutz, the original Innerschutz is based out of, and uh, they would have been celebrating uh, Innerschutz during this time frame in Germany. Uh, actually, I think it was last week or the week before. So Rachel, that's kind of a good tie-in for you. And as always, this is for you. and. Uh, it's about building relationships and, and sharing with each other as we uh, share an hour at the end of our day if you're on the East Coast or the middle of the day if you're where I'm at. But uh, our host, Seth Barker, the extraordinaire, will uh, lead us through uh, the conversation today. So Seth, have at it. Thanks, Jason. So yeah, again, this is, uh, this is all about the membership here. So if anybody has any questions, kind of the rule of engagement, is make sure your mics are muted and fire away in the chat section. That way I can call on you when you have a question and I can see your name. Cause as, as everybody logs on here, it turns into about you know a 60 person tile and I can't see everybody's name. So feel free to fire away. Commissioner, thanks for joining us. Let's just do a little sound check for you. If you can unmute your mic, make sure we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect, awesome. Thanks for being here, right, sir. Great. I appreciate your time. Um, and we're just gonna no, fire thank away. You. Remember, you guys, that if you guys have any questions, this is all about you. And if there's any information that comes up, I put my email up in the top of that chat, and Jason will put his as well. Any any help that we can give, any information, any lesson plans, any research, anything like that, that we can pay it forward, you guys don't hesitate to ask, okay? So, Rachel, thanks for being here. We'll start off with you. So, when yeah. and where is Interstuts? Yeah, so, um, so this is the first uh, inaugural year um of Innerschutz USA which is in Philadelphia this year at the Pennsylvania Convention Center in Philly so uh we've had really great success and a wonderful partnership with the Philadelphia Fire Department of course um hence Commissioner Teal being here so um yeah really good traction um October where the event is October 13th through the 17th um, and that includes hands-on training, um, pre-con workshops, full conference, and of course the exhibit hall. Um, so yeah, that's the when and where. Um, registration is open. I should just give a quick um, plug to the full conferences. I would say about 90% full right now. Um, still trying, still rolling out with um, new classes and um, speakers, sessions, topics, that sort of thing. So, awesome. The number one question out there is: yeah. Is it still going to happen? We see a lot of our partners out there um, getting cold feet, so to speak, and rightfully so. And you know, we want to know what's going to happen in Philly. Yeah, you bet. Um, and after I had a call yesterday with. Adam and he said that's the number one question they're getting too. So a resounding yes, um, it is still on. Um, it, like it might look different, you know. We've got it. We're planning basically with plans A through Z at this point, just based on guidelines we have to follow. Um, any travel restrictions, um, you know. But the main point is that it's still on right now. Um, we're like I said, exhibit hall is going to look a little different. You know, you can't have booths uh, one right next to to each other. So just planning for distancing, um, you know, less touch points at registration, classrooms, you know, full cleaning after every session. So it's uh, it's a it's quite the duty to you know it adds a whole lot more to uh, event planning. That's for sure. But you know our the safety and health of attendees, exhibitors, speakers, everyone involved is top priority. So Adam, if you want to add anything. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, the the good news for us in, in Philadelphia is, uh, you know, I'm also the director of emergency management. So the, uh, well, I guess it's good news, bad news. It, it means that I spend a lot of time uh, in all of these conversations about COVID and reopening and working with our public health department and other city agencies. So we have a really good insight into what everybody's thinking. Uh, and actually, you know, I was on the call. Uh, we were updating yesterday and uh, you know, the mayor called me and uh, that happens a lot. So we have pretty good insight. So when we say it's a go, uh, we feel really confident about that. It's a very large convention center, hosts a lot of uh, events every year. So it's very important for us as a city to get that part of what we do and part of our business back. And right now it looks like uh, Intershoots USA has the, the pole position to be the the first major convention uh, back in the Pennsylvania Convention Center uh, since COVID. And we think that's really, it's, uh, it's probably appropriate that we have a group of fire and emergency services folks who are really paving the way. Uh, and of course, you know, Philadelphia and the fire department has been, uh, you know, uh, and Philadelphia's a city of first. So 1736, Ben Franklin, uh, you know, founded the our fire department. So we think it's great that uh, we're going to be on the leading edge of this thing. And we do feel like, you know, obviously you know, we expect that people will be wearing masks. That's going to be probably the major difference that you'll see. Uh, things will be spread out a little bit, but that's not a big deal because it's a very large venue. Uh, the other nice thing we have going for us here in Philly is we have a lot of different regional training centers and a great relationship with our regional partners. Uh, other folks like the UL FSRI burn facility, uh, is nearby. So we really think we're going to be able to offer a lot of experiences in a socially distanced way that is uh, COVID compliant, but still offers, you know, all of you and attendees and, and families also. That's another thing we really, a lot of great things to do in Philly. We know that schools are questionable uh, across the nation. So we also think it's the kind of place, you know, don't believe the media hype, uh, very safe city. Uh, we really think it's a great place to bring families as well for a, for a long weekend and do Intershoots USA. The other thing, of course, is Oktoberfest in Philly. So uh, you know, our, our local is a partner in this, uh, Local 22 of the IFF, and they have big plan for a very big Oktoberfest celebration. So we want to bring that, uh, bring the best of Germany in all aspects here to Philadelphia. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner Teal. You know, me and Adam met when we were on the Understanding and Fighting Basement Fires uh, tech panel and we spent a lot of time down in philly and a lot of time in delco county and i can't speak enough of how the hospitality with the philadelphia and philadelphia fire department and delco county treated us as far as members of isfsi so we're really excited about this it's going to be a, a tremendous event and the only reason i'm going is because of oktoberfest so i just want to throw that up <laughs> but, Whatever uh, it takes. so Commissioner Teal, what, what's the kind of the, the current state of affairs in Philadelphia? I think that's weighing heavy on everybody's mind as far as, you know, what's going on there? How's the city feel? How do, you know, is there social unrest or is it feeling, you know, super upbeat and positive? I just want to get your thoughts on that. You know, it, it's, uh, again, contrary to popular belief, uh, always a very positive city. You know, we did have protest activity like everybody did around the nation. Uh, we have a lot of fires under normal conditions. So actually we did have more fires over a period of a couple of days there uh, at the end of May, beginning of June. Uh, but then it, it went back to our, our normal uh, level of uh, fire duty fairly quickly. And we did not, you know, one of the things that we didn't see here, uh, people love the fire department here. Our citizens love the fire department. We're always the most trusted city agency. And we didn't see firefighters and medics you know, coming under attack during that. In fact, we have, like a lot of cities, one of these uh, autonomous zones right now. And really the only folks that let in are firefighters. So we have some of our firefighters who go down there, our Homeland Security folks, every day and, and talk with the community. So uh, we actually think things are, are very normal here. And then other things to keep in mind, you know, you have Independence Hall, uh, we have Reading Terminal Market. We have the Art Museum, the Rocky Steps. I drive by the Rocky Steps every day. And, you know, right now it's it's just people getting their pictures taken with the Rocky statue, running up and down the steps. Uh, our rivers, all of our parks are open. And, uh, you know, you'll see people wearing masks, but really we're, we're, for the most part, open for business. Dining is 
Uh, we were kind of, we've been slow rolling on COVID and it turns out that's a, a good news thing for us because we didn't get ahead of it as you saw in other places. So right now we have a lot of outdoor dining opportunities, but we certainly think by October, the whole range of options will be available. You know, we have a lot of uh, Michelin guide restaurants here, a lot of different cuisine types. Mark Davidson can attest to that, not just cheesesteaks. So we have a lot of that is absolutely one of the best foods. You now we have a lot of other things going on here too. And uh, very, again, we have the Museum of the American Revolution, a lot of other things to do besides immerse yourselves and all of the great education and training opportunities that we have available, really involving our entire region. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Rich, I'm gonna switch back to you here. Uh, mm -hmm. What part does ISFSI have in Intershuts? What's, uh, what, what can be offered to the membership and what part do we play in this? Yeah, so um, actually I would say beginning of the year, um, Lee, Adam and I had a discussion on how, you know, how ISFSI can be more involved and um, what can we do to bring our two groups together. Um, and that obviously a big part of that was the, um, was the conference. So we had, oh, a series of sessions and speakers sent over. Um, so ISFSI is powering the um, instructor track at Intershuts USA in the main conference program. So, and without that, you know, it's been a huge help. Everybody's been extremely responsive. Of course, I expect no less. I know, Jason, I'm looking at you. I know uh, <laughs> he was the first one to send his uh, instructor agreement. So <laughs> I, uh, um so i've gotten to know uh each of you over the years and really appreciate the the support um and especially in this new event and new venture um it's just really important to have you know that basis of partnership and um creating a strong strong track and education program yeah absolutely the you know we're really really super excited i think we have eight or nine instructors doing that instructor mm -hmm. track for you guys there that is, that is gonna be um, focused completely on instructor development and, and making you a better instructor back at your own hometown fire department. Right. Um, what makes Intershut stand apart from the other events around the country? Um, well, clearly the easiest answer is, is this the only one that's a go, which is a good thing, but what, you know, what, a, what, are we, what can we anticipate or what, why should people come to this conference? Well, you're right. Um, we were or were the only one who has not either moved their dates or we kind of we stuck our ground in October and that uh, that has turned to be a positive um, for us. So we're staying in October. Um, but as far as what separates us is we're in Philadelphia, I should say, of course, Adam. Um, but having that international piece brought over to the US um, through the Innershitz brand. Um, you know, it, obviously, I'm sure all of you have heard of Innershitz over in Germany, um, but we aren't super reliant on that. You know, it's all about building what we can share amongst ourselves here by adding, you know, those international pieces and opening, opening people's eyes to the different trainings, technologies, um, you know, because I know I do. A lot of people get kind of tunnel vision and you know very um, kind of focused in what they're doing rather than what other people are doing. So and that's um, that's the big piece of the education and um, exhibit floor and all of those all of those pieces. Yeah. So sort of get out of your silo and get challenged by what other people are doing, and, and most certainly get out of your you know demographic. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and really see what the rest of the world is doing, not just the rest of the country. Right, right. And what, um, Sorry, no, I was just going to say how, you know, we're all facing a lot of challenges now, um, both personally, professionally. Um, how are those challenges changing us? Um, again, you know, it, things changed over the past few months. And, you know, what can, what can we help you with? What kind of trainings are you missing? Um, we don't want anybody to fall behind in that. So that's what we're also providing. 
Yeah, Jack is uh, firing off more questions than I can keep up with here, but what's the intention of Intershots staying in Philly, much like FDIC, or are they going to move around, or is this an every two-year event, or what are you guys thinking? Nope, every year. Um, so it'll be every year in October. Um, I believe way in the future, it's in uh, late September. But um, so yeah, Philadelphia, we're sign we have, um, contracts with Philadelphia at the convention center for the next five years, I believe. All so, right. Yep. Lots of cheesesteaks. Lots We're, of cheese Yeah. Steaks. Yeah. And everybody will have their favorite by then. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> kind of a cheesesteak showdown. Uh, Commissioner Teal, I'm going to switch over to you now um, and kind of switch gears here a little bit and talk about, I was hoping you could express uh, what it's like to be, you know, a major part or a major leader during this uh, pandemic in Philly, you know, it's, uh, you know, you guys hit, got hit super, super hard, a very large organization. And, you know, how did that, how'd you navigate that? Yeah, it certainly has been, a, you know, it, it was a lot with just COVID. So I don't know what comes after that. And, you know, then we had the, uh, the protests and we're not unfamiliar with protests and major, major special events. Uh, although this was different, you know, a couple of days of that were sort of what we were accustomed to. Uh, a couple of days were something entirely new. And, you know, as Mark has said there, we're hoping the murder hornets don't show up uh, and they, they move on. But we also had a, a derecho uh, right in the middle of the, the first week in June, which is a tornado without the twist. So we had, I think on that day, we had about 450, almost 500 fire incidents on that day. Uh, you know, average for us is around 150 and uh, seven or eight working fires. Over the days when the civil rest, unrest was really uh, a challenge, we were doing about uh, a working fire or two every hour, including a couple of multiple alarm jobs. Uh, but again, that, you know, folks, for the most part, let us do our jobs. Uh, we are, thankfully, we have been growing over the past several years. Uh, we've, uh, our budget has grown about 35% over the past four years. Uh, we've added almost a thousand positions. So uh, right now our authorized strength is around 3,400 and we're actually growing. We're one of the few fire departments that is still growing, certainly in big cities. Uh, we've invested about $100 million in apparatus over the past four years. So, you know, you can see new apparatus actually, you know, in service fighting fires uh, from all the major manufacturers. Uh, we have 60 medic units on the street every day, uh, 60 engines, 27 ladders, marine units, we protect the airport. And so it, it's a lot. Uh, again, I think for us, it's, you know, our, our folks really, the women and men of the Philadelphia Fire Department really stepped up uh, during all of this. I mean, we did have a pretty major impact on our workforce from COVID. Thankfully, it was spread out over time. So we really didn't have, uh, you know, we, we never had to put units out of service. In fact, we found ourselves during COVID doing all kinds of things. We were running, we basically took over a couple of hotels. I mean, we had fire captains who were running hotels for COVID positive patients. We have been transporting folks that nobody else would transport, uh, whether they were dialysis patients with COVID. Uh, we stood up a, a surge medical center, uh, you know, at one point during the civil unrest, we had 3,300 National Guard soldiers here in town that we were taking care of and uh, su supporting them while they supported us. So it has been, uh, you know, we're in the cloth mask business. You know, we've been producing cloth masks of various kinds for months now. Uh, so we're doing a, a wide range of things. And, and thankfully, we have the scale. We have the folks to be able to do that. We did, unfortunately, have one of our members uh, pass away from COVID uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, Eric Gore. And, uh, you know, we're still dealing with that every day. I, again, I think the good news for us is at our scale, you know, we can absorb having, you know, a number of people off. So we've been able to do right by our members and really, you know, err on the side of caution. Uh, and, you know, they're excited. They're excited for Intershoots USA and, and really happy. You know, they're great. They're really great hosts you know, for and, and representatives of our city. So they're really excited to have folks from around the country and around the world here in Philadelphia. It is a very hospitable city. Um, you know, the whole snowballs at Santa Claus thing, that was a really long time ago. 
Uh, when we had the NFL draft, which was the season the Eagles won the Super Bowl, we had folks wandering <laughs> around in Cowboys jerseys who were not getting beat up or Mark uh, Steelers jerseys, you know, whatever. It's all good. Uh, you know, so we're, we're excited to welcome everybody here. And again, it, it's uh, there's a lot to see here. Again, we're very busy, very active uh, fire and EMS department. We do about a thousand incidents a day, every day, about 800 of those are EMS. Uh, the balance are fire related of some kind. Uh, so there's a lot to see and do here. And we're hoping to really leverage some of those things uh, during Intershoots USA. So we're still, as Rachel said, we're still putting together the whole package. Uh, we're looking forward to having family programs, uh, programs for spouses and significant others. And really, if you just want to come out and you know hang out with firefighters, did I mention we're going to have Oktoberfest? In fact, we might have, it's really going to be, it's going to be Oktoberfest every day. So we're not, we're not, you know, I don't, and, and I want to be really clear about this. You know, we're, we're not in competition with, with anybody else, you know, go where you like, uh, live it up in March or April or June or July, but come to Philly in October and experience Intershoots USA, the best of the world, uh, the best of the USA all here together. We're going to have a lot of departments represented. And again, the other thing that's important to mention is, our geography, when you do the demographics of the fire service and you just look at where firefighters are located, pretty much 50% of all US firefighters are located within a four or five hour drive of Philadelphia. So we're very accessible. We have an American hub. Uh, the Northeast corridor is right here, 30th Street Station. So it's a really easy place to get to. Uh, and you know, so, so bring your family or come yourself and uh, enjoy everything we have to offer. Yeah, when I was there, I just spent, you know, a complete almost day just touring fire stations in and around the city. And I was just thoroughly impressed with the, the pride and ownership of the Philly Fire Department and the suburbs around it. It's interesting to me that you guys sound like you're bigger, better than Chicago Fire Department. So hats off to you with that. Right, Pete? Where's that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I, grew up in Chicago. I grew up in Chicago and Chicagoland, so I have great respect for the Chicago yeah. Fire Department. We just have we're, more fires. We're big there. enough to take that without comment. That's all. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, Rachel, I want to switch back to you here. Um, what's the benefits or what can an ISFSI member get um, by participating at Intershots USA? Yes, yeah, so we have, um, I set up a, a promo code for anybody to use. Of course, our speakers um, those signed up, those speakers signed up do have um, access to the entire conference and show. Uh, for other members, I have um, discounted rates for you if you want. So um, I can, I sent them over to Lee yesterday, but I can um, send them all over to y'all in, individually and um, Get that going. No, that's good. We're going to post um, that on our membership. We're going to post that on our membership page and uh, get that out to all the membership that they get a, a discount when signing up for the conference. So thank you very much for that. That's super awesome. Beautiful. Yeah. So I think uh, you know, Chief Teal, I want to, or Commissioner Teal, I want to go back to you and you know this social unrest stuff and and kind of you know that that I don't know that's that surge of uh, a really trying times for you. Um, how do you how do you train for that? How do you train for keeping your guys, you know, um, tactically engaged and dealing with stuff they'll, they'll probably never deal with with the rest of their career? And then how do you still keep training important when we're going when we're navigating, you know, this unprecedented logistical nightmare? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, early in early in COVID, we were faced with a decision. We have a uh, we have an academy class of 55 firefighter EMTs who are getting ready to graduate. We have another class of 95 that started, I think they were scheduled to start on like March 8th. And, and it's, a, it's a nine month academy for us to do EMT and firefighter. And we were faced with a decision of, well, you know, it's congregate setting, people are gonna be closed. Should we go ahead with these Academy, and we we decided to do that. We pushed ahead. Uh, at one point, there was maybe a, a two week break 
uh, for both of those academies. But we continue to move forward because, to your point, you can never take a break on training. We're still doing a lot of training. We actually started just a couple of weeks ago. We started a program uh, with UL Firefighter Safety Research Institute, a fire dynamics program. We did a train the trainer. Now we're doing that for our whole department, thanks to the Fire Act grants. And we're doing it for around, well, we're doing it for all the, you know, the fire suppression folks in our department. So we're doing it for around, you know, 25 or 2,600 members while COVID is happening, because we know that we can just never take a break. I mean, what's the next thing? Now I got people talking to me about this, the new strain of swine flu. And, uh, you know, are we in the first wave, second wave, third wave of COVID? And then we still have, you know, protest activity, albeit peaceful protest activity every day. And so, but it really is peaceful. And, and we're used to that. The other thing I should say that's, that's important, and we, we talked about this early on with, when we were talking with Intershoots USA, uh, we have about, you know, we're, we'll, we don't have 3,400 firefighters yet, but we're headed that way. So let's just say we have about 3,000 members in the Philadelphia Fire Department. We have about 7,500 members of the Philadelphia Police Department, and we have a great working relationship with PPD, just an incredible working relationship. So it is it is truly one big sisterhood and brotherhood in public safety here, which we know is important uh, if you're going to be visiting a place and wearing a fire department T-shirt. that I mentioned we have T-shirts, lots of T-shirts, and, uh, and, and walking around. So that relationship also helps us do a lot of things that – you know, we're going to be able to support this in, in a really different way, even with what we're dealing, whatever we're dealing with on the street, you know, our regular, uh, you know, 800 to 1,000 incidents every day. If there's something else going on, we're at the scale where we really can continue to support this event. I mean, we're going to have 150 or 200 cadets who are going to be detailed to this event to help support whatever needs done. And uh, the police have really pledged their support already. So we're going to be able to move people around in a different way, uh, keep everybody safe and secure. I mean, that really is here. We know that not every place there's a great relationship between uh, fire and EMS and law enforcement here. It's an incredible relationship. And that was really the most important thing when we dealt with the civil unrest, you know, that working relationship, you know, I'm, I'm in our EOC every day with our police commissioner, our mayor, uh, our managing director, who's like our, our city manager, our COO, and just working through all kinds of things. So that that relationship is, is so solid. Uh, that really was a lot of how we got through it and that we were able to bring all those different perspectives to bear. And I'm fortunate too, that thanks to my kind of checkered career, uh, I, I've done enough different things that I was able to work and speak the language of the National Guard when they showed up, uh, speak the language of law enforcement, and uh, it really made things. But it was it was surreal. I mean, I'll be honest with you. It was surreal to be walking out of my office and stepping over guard soldiers who were in full kit uh, with M4 stacked against the walls. But uh, it's a little counterintuitive. Actually, our citizens, our residents didn't want them to leave. Uh, they ended up loving the National Guard, which is not what you would expect, uh, but they really wanted to get things back to normal. So people love the fire department here. Uh, they love firefighters. They love medics. And uh, we want everybody to come uh, share some of that in the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection. Awesome. Awesome. I can't I can't imagine what you guys have gone through. Um, you know, we just had our second spike out here in nowhere, Montana, and we're at full lockdown mode. And, it's, and I think the total cases in the state of of Montana probably equal, you know, one suburb of where you're at. So hats off to you. Uh, Rachel, switch gears with you here. And, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the instructor tracks at Intershuts and uh, mm -hmm. we talked about professional development for instructors. What are the professional development opportunities? This is a very unique thing that I think uh, you guys are really uh, hitting a home run on is, is actually having these professional tracks that somebody can concentrate on as opposed to just kind of cherry picking classes that look interesting. So I don't know if you can speak to that or not. Right. That was um, in putting the board or I'm sorry, I was going to talk about the board, but um, in putting together the program with our board, um, that was one of the things that I know I wanted to focus on was really taking a deep dive into these tracks rather than a grab bag of anything. You know, um, I like 
giving purpose to the progression during the conference, whether it's um, one of the topics that we're working through right now is um, mental health. Like there's two bookends, you know, the pre-con workshop, which is either a full day or a half day session, and then kind of building on that throughout the week. Um, you can you can take one, you can take them all, you can take the middle, you know, but each each is different. Um, but it also could be looked at as um, kind of a chronological um, training or, you know, that piece of education. Um, I am also working on, given the, the state of things and a lot of trainings being canceled, um, one piece I'm working on now is with within like the EBT um, programs and certifications and um, classes where it's not, it won't be, you know, a full day program, but we're, we're doing like a hybrid. So part classroom and then on the fl show floor, taking apart a pumper. Um, so in that way, it just, it just adds some, a little bit of interest to the show floor during those hours, as well as, you know, giving people um, the experience and the training that they've missed out on throughout the year. Yeah, so, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, would it be possible to sign up for, you know, multiple years or, or, you know, commit to multiple years and have that same track kind of progress through? So let's say, you know, you're interested in the mental health side or, or something mm -hmm. to that effect, that you can really just kind of own that whole track moving through, navigating through more than two to three years. Right, right. And I, that's what I like is that um, I, I did not want that the program to be, you know, just this year. Um, I believe you build on things you've le learned in the past, previous years, experiences, people change every year. So your situ you take a class this year, next year your situation might be different. Um, hopefully all of our situations are different next year, but um, <laughs> you'll still be at Innershots USA. Um, but you build on that each year and each year you get you know, you can, um, you know, pass it on to your department when you get back, you know, those pieces that you learned and built on. Yeah, because I think everybody's interests change over their career too. You know, you start out at that kind of that task level, moving through your first couple of conferences, and then you get into the kind of, you know, a little bit more of the supervisor level or that company officer level, level and then, you know, leadership tracks or instructor tracks. So I think that's really important to kind For of sure. have that path to show mm -hmm you know, the student or the participant, if you will, that they can, uh, you know, really kind of own that whole piece of their career and really try to concentrate on what they're doing at that point in time. Correct. I'm super excited about it. I think the instructor track is, is something that we've been really striving for hard with ISFSI and packaging that. And I think the delivery here at InterShots is just going to be uh, amazing. I'm really, really excited about it. Yeah, so are we. Well, uh, Brad French, good to see you, brother. What do you got to add? Hey, not much. Uh, sorry, I'm late. Uh, fun to fun to look around and see a lot of familiar faces on here. I'm wondering who beat up Jason Coy. Um, I see some type of uh, some type of an arm device there. So, right. um, but anyways, no, it's great to see everybody. Um, from work myself, doing training officer stuff, of course, and I'm super excited to to be doing something in the instructor track creating and managing an effective, effective training officer program, excuse me. Um, and it's it's pretty much gonna be exactly what it sounds like, um, kind of building on a lot of the core concepts from the ISFSI training officer credential program and and, and pulling out the bits and pieces that I think are most effective to package into a, um, into a little shorter time frame like that and adding on some of my own experiences uh, as a training officer and training admin now. So uh, very excited, uh, very excited about the program and uh, looking forward to seeing everybody up there. Awesome. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, looking forward to it. So with that, I'm going to open up the floor to some questions, unless uh, Commissioner Tilly have something more to add. Um, I've kind of run out of my questions that I have in front of me here. Yeah, the, the thing I would, I, I also want to reiterate is this is, you know, as we would say in Philly, uh, well, we're the hosts of Energy USA, uh, and we want to be great hosts, and we want to have all these events, Oktoberfest, 
we really want to do wel- welcome the, the best of the world and the best of the USA to Philadelphia. But this isn't, as we would say, just a Philly John. Uh, we want to you know, keep in mind we have one of our early partners, uh, Delaware State Fire School. If you look at our promo video, there's a, a blue fire engine in there. That's not from Philly, but that's in there for a reason. So we have great partnerships with our region here in Southeast Pennsylvania. Uh, actually, even closer to my office than anywhere else is uh, Camden, New Jersey. And we have great working relationships with fire departments and training academies over there. Uh, Delaware is very close. Maryland is very close. Uh, Virginia is right down the road, New York. So we are frequently you know, working with all of these different agencies and partners. And we want to make sure that you get to see you know, in some of our training sessions, uh, may very well be at some of the uh, the academies. We have some great academies here, uh, not just ours. So we really want to, we plan to show everybody a flavor of the entire region, uh, you know, our, the USA and, and the world. Our program has been put together by a conference advisory board that represents a number of different countries and uh, a lot of different departments, literally coast to coast in the US and coast to coast in Canada. That was important to us. They're also largely, you know, active. These are folks who are working in the industry today, you know. Uh, so uh, we thought it was important that our program is developed in a, a, a current and contemporary fashion. Uh, and I think you can see that in the, the programs that are up there already. And we're not done. We're not done putting content up there. We're not done. Uh, we also want to do things in a little bit different way. We did some piloting here. We had a technology symposium that we hosted uh, with the NFFF, I guess it was last year, seems like a long time ago. And we, we tried some different things in terms of the way the, the training and education is structured. So we're going to be doing some different formatting. Uh, you know, I, I don't, the death by PowerPoint thing, I don't know that that works for anybody, but uh, we, we really want to try to avoid that. And that's one of the reasons we were so excited about the partnership with ISFSI is bringing contemporary adult learning principles and practices to what we're doing. And we're gonna do that in a host of different ways, Uh, panels, poster presentations, people wandering around the floor, side meetings, uh, short, you know, shorter sessions. So we really want to, in addition to kind of the the flagship programming, we're gonna be doing a lot of different things because we also know, and I know from going to these events now for longer than I care to, to think about, uh, a lot of that learning really does take place outside of the formal classroom session. So we're going to, you know, this is a city of innovation. Right now, Philadelphia is the number one startup ecosystem in the country, uh, and that's post-COVID. So we're also, we want to bring some of that that energy and that flavor to, to Interstates USA as well. So it's entirely possible that we'll have folks from outside industries, outside fire and EMS. You know, we have some great partnerships around behavioral health, uh, unmanned systems. So we're doing some really innovative things here and we want to show all that off. Uh, we also want to learn from other people. You know, this is uh, that's really critical for us that we're bringing all of you and everybody who registers in so we can learn things as well. Even yeah. from our brothers and sisters in Chicago. <laughs> I really like the I really like the methodology or the thinking process of of you know keeping the people that are on the front lines or keeping the people that are doing the work you know kind of engaged in this conference and, and really uh, seeing what the what the troops on the ground are doing. Uh, Jack, you had a question there. You want to fire that away? Yeah, Adam and uh, Rachel, I'm wondering, are there any specific content or topics that you're looking for to fill in the blanks? We might know some instructors who might be interested. If you can give us an idea, if there's a a field of practice that you're looking at, maybe we can point somebody in that direction. Yeah, I've got um, I've got a couple. Um, let me look at my list, and I can I can let you guys know. Um, but I know we do have a few that we we could fill. Yeah. So the, the the biggest question that we on the ISFSI board get is how can we help and how can we contribute? And so. Mm-hmm. You know, the cadre is huge, obviously. So, you know, we got a lot of talent out there that, that would be willing to, you know, lend a hand, so to speak. So if there's something that you guys are looking for specifically, we can put that out to our membership and get everybody engaged. You know, and that reminds me that, you know, we're, we're uh, watering, not watering down, but we're reducing the frequency of these happy hours to the first and the third 
week, Wednesday of every month, as opposed to every week and uh, trying to, you know, boost up the numbers, but um, also give you some quality content too, rather than delivering uh, every week. Did I get that right, Pete? First and third week? Yeah, first first and third Wednesday of every month. And a lot of it just had to do with respecting people's time, especially during the summer. And as things start to open up, we're starting, because this was partially a fill in the blanks, right? Everything got shut down and everybody was kind of stagnant. And this was meant to sort of plug that hole, if you will, but it's morphed into some other things. This has turned out to be a really good way for us to just keep touch with each other, um, you know, share share uh, our connections with people like Commissioner Thiel and, and Dan Majorkowski and all that kind of stuff, and, and just give us a chance to touch base on a regular basis. And I think we can do it more more effectively if we move to a couple times a month. I don't want to go as, as little as once a month because because then it's easy to forget, you know, when are we really doing this? But I think that first and um, third Wednesday will work out really well. It's consistent enough, but not too frequent that we're, you know, bumping into other things. So that's, awesome. that's what you do, yeah. Thanks, Pete. Okay, in closing, uh, Rachel, do you have anything you wanna add or plug in there before we uh, turn over to questions and button this thing up? Um, one, one thing I wanted to add, just based on um, your previous question uh, regarding um, any consent or anything we need filled, uh, we're having education on the show floor um, in a little theater area. And this, I envision this being, you know, just like quick little TED talk type yeah. um, pieces of education throughout the day. You know, I don't, I want everybody to experience a form of education throughout the show, whether or not they are, a, have the conference package or not. Um, so if, if you all have any suggestions or topics that you think would be good to fit in those little bits of time, let me know. Um, I'd yeah, to, love to hear them. I'd love to entertain. That's an excellent, excellent idea. You know, on our fall conference, we started doing, you know, in between the, you know, the hour, hour and 15 minute presentations. We did those 15 minute TED Talks and got mm -hmm. tremendous engagement. And I think that's a very powerful tool because that's about, my intention span these days is about 15 minutes. So I think that's a really is, well is thought time frame you're looking at, Rachel, is 15 minutes, you think? Yeah, I would say 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Because as Rachel. we're uh, uh, talking about, the people are going to want to know what, what's the expectation going to yeah. be. Yeah. Yeah. And I, um, I, throughout the program, and instructors will know this about me, I didn't want, I didn't want them to fit into what I think talk or length of time um i don't believe in the hour it has to be an hour and you know hour and a half or whatever it is um if you have the amount of content that's what the class length should be um i'm very flexible with timing um so i'm working with the instructors rather than them working for me if that makes sense totally can you remind us on the dates real quick rachel yeah, October 13th through the 17th. Okay, thanks. And we're going to close it out with Commissioner here. What, any final thoughts or closing remarks? No, again, I think you'll see we, we've talked a lot about the education and the training, which is which is righteous uh, since this is an ISFSI, John. And uh, we are going to have other events. We're going to have stair climbs. We're going to have a, a 5K run that our local sponsoring that's also some of those proceeds are going to go to uh, cancer research and breast cancer research. So there's a lot of other activities and we are going to have, you know, we, we kind of mentioned it in passing. We do have a lot of sponsors who are signed up a lot of, so there's going to be a lot to see on the show floor. And some of these folks, you know, they haven't been able to show off their latest and greatest kit or their latest and greatest apparatus. Uh, so we're going to have some of our new apparatus there. And again, we've bought a lot of that. Uh, as well as new uh, equipment and other things that just really nobody's been able to see or you haven't been able to put hands on. You know, maybe you've seen it in a Zoom, but you haven't been able to put hands on it. So uh, Rachel and her crew have been doing a great job uh, to make sure that really you're going to have a, a holistic experience. And uh, we're excited that the instructor track's powered by ISFSI and uh, look forward to seeing you all in October. Well, I, I, fully recognize how busy both of you are. So I really, really appreciate both your time. It's a, it's a big deal to jump on with us and uh, 
and give us some guidance. Uh, Brad just posted a link to Intersheds USA, so you can click on that. And I'm gonna stay on the line if there's any questions for me. And my email and Jason's email are at the top of that chat line, so you can email both of us and we'll try to direct you in the right direction. And uh, with that, I think we'll see you guys in about two weeks, unless, uh, Pete, you have anything to add? Okay. Well, thanks well, a lot for everybody's time. Uh, we'll, keep, we'll keep the thing open in case anybody wants to just talk in general, but, you know, we yep. got some, but if you need to sign off and get back to making business, go ahead. We appreciate awesome. your time. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Rachel. Really. Yeah, Adam and Rachel, thank you very, very, very much for your time. I know you guys are busy. So thanks again. All right, guys. See you in two thank weeks. You. Thank you all. Stay safe. All right. What's going on, guys? Hey, I'm all sorry. I came in late. I missed the whole conversation. Oh, sorry. I think what happened here, you guys, is that when Lee got on, she pushed record. And then when she got off, it stopped recording. So that's a big bummer if that yeah. is what happened. But it is what it is. All right. Hey, Seth. Okay. Can, uh, conversation. Can, uh, we can. Uh, I, both of you guys want to same time. Mark, go first. Oops, sorry. Yeah, I was, I was just going to chime in on that little conversation there on the end about the 15 to 20 minute content package. We're just getting ready to roll out a, a series called Quick Knock, where that the the speakers are purposefully limited to 15 to 20 minutes and, you know, five, 10 minutes of maybe questions or discussion afterwards. But um, one of the things I've noticed with a lot of the content packages that are being delivered now is that they they're you know, in a classroom environment going an hour and a half, two hours, four hours, you know, you can work that, the instructor's reading the room, you're taking breaks, you're moving around the space. But particularly for webinar content, it just seems like uh, some folks aren't adapting, they're taking their existing content package and just saying, oh, I'll just deliver it online. It's the same thing. And and the the, the the thought I have is that two hours of webinar is like two hours of TV without the funny commercials. And, and at that point, you, you'd really have to be given away winning lottery ticket numbers to keep people engaged. So to that end, that, that shorter is better, I think is for, for all of us as instructors is something we should consider if we're doing online content to, to, to push out there. Yeah, because it's our target audience too. We've all got ADD and a million things going and, and staying engaged for long periods of time is, is difficult at best. Yeah, your timing is, is perfect on that. Fairfax is doing that? Both me and Pete just started uh, trying to do our classes for an online delivery. The first one being for me was the safe law enforcement operations on the fire ground. And it was probably one of the hardest things I've done as an instructor and so much that I'm like almost adamantly against it. But I see your point of, of, you know, that 15 minute delivery, which would be perfect. And then you could have a couple of questions after that, but uh, you know, sitting through, unless it's a UL presentation, sitting through anything more than an hour, I'm done with it. And so, and it's very, very, very hard for me as an instructor to do without a class in front of me to bounce those things off and get interactions and get questions, you know, Hey Seth, it, but I, I can't stand it. Hey Seth, yeah Jack. We just had the uh, NVFC training summit over the weekend, and the instructors were doing a virtual 15-minute presentation on their classes as they originally intended for the summit, which got canceled like a lot of things. And um, I got to tell you, that's the first time that I've condensed everything into 15 minutes and listening to the other instructors. It was much better than I expected. Yeah, and um, we were still able to get the information across. Good speakers coming on in a short period of time. The only thing that I don't think that worked real well was interaction with the students. Yeah, everybody was kept to a very strict schedule. 15 minutes here, introduce the next speaker. Another 15 minutes, introduce the next speaker. Another 15 minutes, take a break. Um, the interaction with the students wasn't there, but the information that was delivered in 15 minute segments was very good. Everybody did a great job with it. You know, and I'm, I'm almost leaning towards that for this venue too, because, you know, there's what we, what we struggle with is, you know, the difference between a happy hour and a webinar and an online delivery, right? So those are three very different things that almost get blended into, you know, it's kind of gray lines on each end. 
but for the happy hour, I think it would be hugely powerful to do a 15 minute quick little thing. And then that fuels the discussion moving forward. You know, that we almost hit that mark with uh, Brian Crandall, you know, he started, he was kind of in the 10 to 15 minute range and then that really got everybody talking. Um, you know, these are great. Like the happy hours are great, but like when people aren't asking questions and people aren't engaged, it, it becomes challenging for me, challenging for Jason, you know, so kind of need that subject matter to get everybody talking or fired up. And, and to Jack's point, I think what, if you're coordinating instruction or getting people on board, it's making sure they understand you, you don't get to take your hour package, content package and, and speak really fast and click yeah. really fast. So you get it in 15 minutes. <laughs> the instructions I'm giving our people is that if you have a, a, something that's a two hours in the can, you're only picking three slides. Pick the, the three slides that you want to blow up the discussion on, and that's it. You know, don't don't try and wedge it in there. So that, that'd be the other talking point for, for delivering on that platform. Yeah, you know, it's funny. One of the instructor development classes that I went to made us do seven slides max, and each slide was timed at 45 seconds. So you could not you weren't you weren't in control of the slide going through so you had to keep the dialogue moving and it just forced you to have a more fluent conversation rather than this robotic instructor my good mark, friend what, hey buddy mark, what are you doing um this is with fairfax are you doing this like a like a um closed circuit tv kind of thing no no it's going to be zoom based uh uh basically uh reaching out for anybody oh, it, it's like right. It, basically, what started this was riding the seat, riding the buggy, and the idea of not um, taking that brand, quote unquote, and just putting it online. And so the idea I had was we can't do an hour or two hours or four hours in that format online. So let's go the other way with it, turn into it and say 15, 20 minutes max, still topics that are important. Uh, with the same ideas we want to develop the instructors we have in-house that maybe have never presented before yeah. and also then engage voices from around the region around the country uh, so the first one out the gate is going to be one of my uh has or, or hazmat bc who's he hasn't really presented before and it's just such a it's like i always say you know comics working out their material they go to all the dive bars before they go to the netflix special we're like the dive bar so he'll be able to get up there 15 minutes talking about chemical emergencies for swimming pools, you know, timely topic, get it out there. We're going to record it and then put it on our target solution so the members can catch it, you know, whenever, you know, they can use the shift leader can use it as a, a you know, morning drill or whatever, and just build out that library uh, of content with these just really quick packages. And, and we're in good company here, so I'll, I'll say this, part of my guiding directions to the folks that we've talked to so far is, I should be able to listen to this while I'm on the uh, porcelain and not have my legs go numb. So just really quick, impactful hit, and then move on. And that's that's the goal for it. I love it, I love it. Yeah, Tony. Um, no, that that's good. I just did a, I did a webinar, well, it was a online class. It was six hours. Um, with uh, uh, Standpipe, uh, Dave McGrail, which I mean, it's good, it's good information, you know. But mm -hmm. yeah, that was that was tough. We went for 45 minutes. He, we, you know, let us off for 10 minutes. We came back, um, you know, while again, while the information was great, um, it was, it was. Uh, I'm at home, you know, so you get you get off to do something else. Yes. Um, I don't know that. Um, again, I, I mean, I, I definitely lost, you know. But it was, it was, it was tough. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, it's like watching a long TV show without the funny commercials. At a certain point, your attention span. Plus, you know, when you look at, hey, I just got home from work. Hey, honey, I'm going to be checked out for another six hours. The next sound you hear is the skillet getting rung across your head. So, you know, again, you, something that you can just watch really quick, uh, you know, when you're just tooling around the house or whatever is kind of the idea. Awesome. All right, uh, Jack, do you have something? I was going to just pile on a little bit. Yeah, um, no, I was uh, I was just going to say if if we look at these little TED Talk deals and the little 15 to 20 minute discussions, um, you know, I guess in my mind is providing more resources than anything for people to go to. Uh, there's a lot of smart people out there. There's a lot of intelligent people. 
Um, I, for one, have a presentation that's kind of chunked out into little four hour blocks, if you will, that can easily be broken down. And just what's going through my mind right here, if anybody else is looking at these kind of things, is just, you know, chunk it out, but provide the resources. If we want to talk about a certain topic or something, make sure we include those resources in there for people to go to and let them go and learn on their own versus us boring them with death by PowerPoint. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that. More than uh, just the resources, because we've done a, a version of this in Illinois with uh, leadership training. And because it is in the classroom, it's more the, the instructors are limited to 45 minute presentations, and then they have to move to the group discussion or activity or whatever, right? Um, the correlation would be, so 10 or 15 or 20 minutes for the online, but then more than just resources, I think you gotta leave them with an exercise to do, something that's structured, right? That's written out or that they can log on to or whatever that says, okay, here's how you, here's how you proceed on your own. You know, give them a little bit of structure rather than just, okay, is there any discussion? Eh, maybe not really, okay? But if you give them something to work with, um, then they'll really run with it because you've given them that little bit of structure that says, okay, here, here's where you go next and here's how to use this. Yeah, Jerry. Hey, um, I'm getting um, getting beat up here. My my wife is a teacher of teachers, right? And she's over, she's listening to this. And her um, um, uh, throw in there would be maybe just the opposite, uh, Chief. Maybe th do the do the uh, uh, the the exercise first, do, and yeah. then wrap it up. You know. But either well, we way, that's another, you know, that's another key to the brief presentation is that flipping the classroom and making sure that they have work to do ahead of time and that they come prepared. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. And I think even the 15 minute thing, I, I like the 15 minute idea, which then, especially if you get one that leads to like 45 minutes of discussion, right? Yeah. And whether it's, whether it's discussion in the classroom or discussion at the uh, lunch table or something that really, really gets people, you know, um, inspired to think about or talk about what you're, what you're doing. That's exactly like the training officer credentials set up, you know, and, and the hopes, again, I know I keep on talking about it for four months straight here, but, you know, the hopes is getting that to be an online deliverable um, with a virtual classroom like this. But they're all coming in with all these projects done, such as creating lesson plans, doing a quick video, on and on and on to improve their instructor track. And then it's a facilitated discussion during class. It's, it's 15 instructors saying, okay, what did you pick for a subject matter? How did you deliver it? How is it perceived? And what, you know, how was it measured, so to speak? So good stuff. I got another idea that I'd like to, uh, I'll pass it on to Rachel too, but I don't know about you guys, but some of the better conversations I've had over the years has always been in the instructor ready room at FDIC, sitting around the table, having a conversation. I mean, we've sat there sometimes for two hours at a time going over something. It would be good if I, ISFSI could have a speaker room someplace that we could just hang out in between classes or sessions or whatever and give people the chance to come in and have a conversation, maybe even recruit some new members at the same time. I yeah, wonder if she can make arrangements for us to have a room somewhere to uh, know, hang out in the conference hall. If, if, you, which, if you're gonna approach her, Jack, I would suggest um, allowing us to just camp out in the ready room, uh, which we have actually done, I think it was at Firehouse. I'm not sure if it was World or Expo or whatever. But there was a year or two where they gave us permission to to camp out in that speaker room, right? Um, and and so as people came and went, we were there with our swag and with our folks, and and we just would greet them and yeah, exactly. So it doesn't necessarily. I mean, I think ideally it would be the speaker room, right? If they don't want us to intrude on that space, then a separate room would be fine. Um, but that's that's a great idea. We and and we've tried to do that with that other big organization, but they've always said no. Um, <laughs> but we had some luck with Firehouse, so it's okay. You know, everybody's gonna run well, their own thing. I think we've got a real opportunity with this conference. We've got the right yeah. people in place. So they seem really open to all that kind of stuff. So yeah. let's leverage that, especially the first time around. Great idea. All so, right, guys. Major League Baseball, right? <laughs> all righty. Great seeing everybody. Yeah. Give me Thanks, all our evening for you guys, and uh, we'll see, we'll talk to you guys soon. Okay, and, and keep an eye on uh, the UL, that whole thing with Philly and the train the trainer they did. They're about to release a little video 
because Philly's hitting the street with their stuff. So you all's pushing out a video. It's going to go public in the next day or two. And that's not you know, the whole. Is that the boot camp thing, or is that something yeah, different? Just like a you know ten minute, five or ten minute you know PR piece. Uh, but how how Philly's taking advantage of the UL work and all that kind of stuff. It's 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 as everything that they're doing now. It's it's nice stuff. So if you get a chance to check it out, um, got an email from Dan today. It says it's going out um, either today or tomorrow, going public. Okay, cool. All right, guys. All right, thank guys. you. Thank you for being here. As always. Talk to you guys yeah. soon. Cool.